Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I am here with Stuart Newberger, the author of The Forgotten Flight, Terrorism, Diplomacy, and the Pursuit of Justice. Stu, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here. Now, could you please just give our audience a little bit of background into who you are and how you came to do the work that you do? Certainly. I'm currently uh, a senior partner in the Washington office of international law firm Kroll & Mooring. I've uh, been practicing law for almost 40 years, graduated from Georgetown Law, clerked for a federal judge in Washington, Harold Green, spent almost seven years as an assistant United States attorney uh, here in D.C., representing the United States in court on both civil and criminal matters. And I've been at Kroll & Mooring now for about 29 years, and my practice uh, although it's uh, quite varied over the years, certainly for the last 15 or 20 years, it has focused mostly on international dispute work, and that falls into different categories. The subject of this call in my book, of course, is um, representing victims of international terrorism uh, who have claims against foreign states under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. I also uh, do a lot of non-terrorism work under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, contract cases, expropriation, that sort of thing. I also do a lot of international commercial arbitration around the world and international investment treaty arbitration around the world. And um, I founded our firm's international dispute resolution practice. And so that's pretty much what I do. Most of my work is representing clients, both individuals, families, and companies uh, against foreign states, although we have at times also represented certain states on on cases. And that's uh, my practice in a nutshell. Okay. So let's get into the particular case that drove you to write your very first book. Now, when I was mentioning to my mother, I'm going to record this podcast with a lawyer in a case that involves a passenger plane that was downed by a Libyan bomb, a suitcase bomb. She said to me, oh, you mean Lockerbie. Now, that must be a reaction you get a lot. Can you tell us exactly what this flight was, the forgotten flight? Yes. And that reaction, by the way, is what you get from everyone, including people who are quite worldly, uh, study history, politics, and current events. And except for people in Paris and in West Africa, the September 19th, 1989 destruction of French airliner UTA Flight 772, uh, which was flying from Central Africa to Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport, was destroyed seven miles uh, above the earth by a suitcase bomb planted by Libyan intelligence agents in Brazzaville, Congo. The terrorist attack killed 170 innocent passengers crew and uh, was at the time uh, the biggest uh, French murder investigation in history. Uh, It occurred about nine and a half months after the Pan Am 103 flight had been blown up while flying from London's Heathrow Airport to New York's John Kennedy Airport, JFK, and crashed into a small Scottish village called Lockerbie. And of course, Lockerbie, uh, which was in December of 1988, really until September 11, was the most notorious terrorist attack in the West involving Americans and Brits uh, in history. And uh, just the word Lockerbie, as as your mother recited to you, itself connotes uh, an image of of terrorism and attacking and blowing up uh, civilian jumbo jets. Very few people, other than the French and the people who were directly affected, were even aware that nine and a half months after Gaddafi and his intelligence agencies planted a suitcase bomb on uh, the uh, Pan Am 103 flight that crashed into Lockerbie, Scotland, they blew up another jumbo jet, a DC-10 wide-body jet, which was actually owned by an American company called Interlease, uh, which was owned by a former Navy and Delta pilot named uh, Doug Matthews. That plane, the DC-10, was the second jumbo jet that Gaddafi and his agents blew up. But because of the overwhelming publicity and the criminal investigation by the FBI and Scotland Yard, very few people thought of anything other than the Pan Am 103 Lockerbie disaster. Indeed, years later, The BBC itself referred to the UTA 772 flight as the forgotten flight because no one really thought about it, not the press, not the governments involved. 
And except for the French and the case that I pursued here in Washington, D.C., it would have remained the forgotten flight. Now, you've been involved in many suits that have gotten quite a bit of attention. I'm thinking about Terry Anderson's suit against Iran and and other very high-profile cases. What is it about this particular case that stuck with you and drove you to write this book, your very first book, as far as I know? Yes, um, and it's not what I do in my day job, so uh, practicing law and running a big practice here at Kroll and Mooring is what I normally do. Well, in short, when I was approached by Doug Matthews, the owner of the plane through Interlease, uh, who had lost the plane, to represent him in a claim against Libya, and he also indicated there were seven Americans who were killed on the plane, in the you know very small world that, that I live in and many of us live in, one of the people killed on the flight was Bonnie Pugh. Her husband, Bob Pugh, was the United States ambassador to Chad, where the plane had made a stop before taking off and then being blown up over the next country, Niger. Ambassador Bob Pugh, six years before the UTA disaster, had been the deputy chief of mission, the basically the deputy ambassador, at the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, when it was blown up by a suicide truck bombing carried out by Iran and Hezbollah. And I was already handling the case for the Americans who were killed and injured in the Beirut embassy bombing against Iran when I was approached to handle the UTA case. And ironically, I had already spoken with Bob Pugh as a witness in the Beirut embassy bombing, not as a client, before I was even approached about the UTA case by Doug Matthews. So that was one of these incredible coincidences that happens, particularly in Washington. Secondly, when I took on the case against Libya, one of the things that made these cases different from the cases against Iran is that Iran would usually default on these cases, not wanting to contest liability, although they do come in and hire lawyers to contest it when you go after their money. But with Libya, Gaddafi and his government made a decision that they would defend all the cases. They defended the Lockerbie case up in New York. They defended my case. They defended the Love Elviso case and a handful of other cases that were brought. So that also made it very different in that a lawyer for Libya on the other side would raise all kinds of defenses and both defenses to try and get it dismissed and to create delay, which they were very good at. The third and maybe one of the most interesting aspects of this case was when I took it on and Doug Matthews and I went to Paris for the first visit we met with Magistrate Judge Jean-Louis Bruguer. At the time, Judge Bruguer, who's now retired, was the leading investigator in France of terrorist cases. Uh, very, very famous investigator. And when we went to his office in the Palais de Justice, he started telling us about the investigation he had run for a number of years involving UTA. And I had never heard, even when I had been hired, and even though I'm very involved in this area, had never heard the story of how Judge Bruguer and his colleagues had cracked the case using the most extraordinary forensic and, uh, as we say, shoe leather detective work to prove conclusively, without any shadow of a doubt, that the Libyan intelligence services at the highest levels were responsible for placing the suitcase bomb on the UTA 772 flight. After I heard that story from Judge Bruguer in his office, And after I later obtained the originals of all the criminal files that the French investigators had compiled to prosecute the Libyans responsible for the murder of 170 people, I knew that we were onto something special. And working on the case as an advocate for all those years, which is told in the book, uh, I think was one of the most challenging and also one of the more satisfying cases I've ever worked on. The story of how the French investigators, led by Judge Bruguer, cracked the case with a worldwide detective story, if you will, really has to rank as one of the greatest detective stories in modern history. And that's another reason that I wanted to write this book. I would agree. Having read it, I would say the first half, you know, you give us a good grounding in the kinds of terrorism that had gone on, either perpetrated by Libya or just in the region, and then this incredible French detective story. And I was able to learn a little bit about the French judicial system and what happened in there. One thing to point out to our readers is this plane went down in the desert and the French investigators had to fly 
to was it was it Chad? Or was the Tenere Desert? Was it in Chad that the plane crashed, or were they in a different country? By no, then? it took off from Chad, and then crashed into Niger, one of the most remote and desolate places in the world. And when the plane went down, as I described at the beginning of the book, there are no roads near the crash site. It's almost 400 kilometers to the nearest village. That's how far away it is from anything. And the French paratroopers who were out looking for the plane or its wreckage uh, after the plane was reported lost had to parachute into the crash zone because there was no other way to get there. Incredible. And one of the pieces of forensic evidence that they found, could you talk about the circuit board? And it's incredible to me that they were able to find this within the wreckage. But could you talk? This is just an example of the kind of investigative work that the French did into this case. This is right out of CSI, except this is not fiction. This is why it's such an extraordinary detective story. The plane, uh, as I said, a DC-10 jumbo jet, was broken up into many pieces when the suitcase bomb exploded in the baggage hold area. It crashed in many pieces, scattered over 40 square miles, 40 square miles of a crash zone. That's a very, very wide search area, particularly when there's nothing there except sand. There is no trees, there's no grass, there's literally nothing, no roads, no villages, no people. And when Judge Berger and his team were pretty much sure that this had been a suitcase bomb, because they found fragments of pentrite, a plastic explosive, on some of the suitcases, they knew that this was a bomb, not an engine failure, pilot failure, that sort of thing. And then, for several years... Judge Berger's team combed the 40-square-mile area. Just imagine young French foreign legionnaires shoulder to shoulder in 120-degree heat, looking down at all times with little nets, picking up any piece of anything that might, might go into the baggage area of a jumbo jet so that they could reassemble in a giant jigsaw puzzle the baggage area back in Paris, outside Paris at a, at a hangar at an airport. The rest of the plane, by the way, is still sitting in the desert even today like a shipwreck. But the baggage area, they reassembled. It took them several years to do this, working with aerospace and jet engineers. And when they eventually patched it together, which was itself an extraordinary job, the engineers piecing it back together saw that there was a small, meaning about five centimeters, piece of green circuit board, which was bent and twisted, which indicated forensically that it had been very, very close to the blast zone of the bomb. So the forensic folks said, okay, this may very well have been near the bomb. But the French engineers could not figure out where this circuit board went in the plane. They had all the manuals from McDonnell Douglas, which had manufactured the plane in Southern California. Of course, it's now part of Boeing. And so they eventually flew to Southern California and went to the chief engineers of McDonnell Douglas and said, we can't figure out where this little piece of circuit board goes in the plane. Could you please help us? And the McDonnell Douglas people said, that's not from our airplane. And the French investigators responded, but it has to be. There's nothing else there. There's no roads. There's no trash that people throw out of their cars. There's literally nothing. But the McDonnell Douglas people were adamant. That circuit board is not from our airplane. And it was at that point that Bruguer and his investigators realized that they may have found a piece of the bomb. Now, the one lucky thing, other than finding this thing in the desert, which itself was extraordinary, was that on the back of this circuit board, very faded and difficult to see, were some initials. And they eventually, after a lot of investigative work and human intelligence work, recall this is before the internet, before Google, before computers, they eventually tracked down to a small little shop in Taiwan, a store, a a little factory that manufactured this circuit board. And they went there 
And they said, did you manufacture this circuit board? And the person said, yes. And they said, well, where do you have records of where you sold them at a certain time in 1989? He said, yeah, I may. I sold them to this company down the street that assembles the circuit board into a bigger machine, which is then sold to a German company, which assembles timers. And that's when the French knew they were onto something. And they eventually traced these timers to a company in Germany, which itself sold these timers to customers around the world. But one additional lucky break was when they went to the German manufacturer, a company called Grassland, and asked, do you have any records of where these timers were sold during the relevant time leading up to the attack in 1989? And they said, well, we don't usually keep those records, but being efficient German manufacturers, they did have records. And they pulled out an invoice for 100 of these very timers to the Libyan intelligence services in Tripoli. And not only that, they had a canceled check from the Libyan government showing they had been paid for and delivered to a man who was later identified by French intelligence sources as a senior member of the Libyan intelligence services network. And that's how Judge Berger and his team over many years were able to prove conclusively that the Libyan intelligence services had been responsible for placing this bomb on the UTA flight. So up to this point in this saga, this has been sort of a French detective tale. And for our readers, there is a position in France, an investigative magistrate. And that Correct. is what Judge Breguer was serving as. This isn't like an America a courtroom judge. Up to this point, it's been a detective story. And then for kind of the first time, we see diplomacy intrude into the familiar path of justice that we are um, used to seeing. What happened diplomatically that changed the course of this French investigation? Well, remember that the French investigation of UTA and the British-American investigation of Pan Am 103 Lockerbie were proceeding on entirely separate tracks for many years. And it was only much later that the French joined with the American and the Brits to basically compare their investigations. This ultimately led to the United Nations Security Council issuing a series of sanctions on Libya for both the Pan Am Lockerbie flight and the UTA flight. Another thing that people have forgotten, that the UN Security Council sanctions were for both planes. But it took a long time for those investigations to come together. And what happened was that Gaddafi was trying to untangle himself from both of these cases. He was dragging things out with the Brits and the French. And at the same time, a new president had been elected in France, Jacques Chirac. And Jacques Chirac had decided that it was more important for French oil companies and corporations and businesses to resume business with Gaddafi and the billions of dollars that would flow from that, as well as the oil, than it was to hold people accountable for the greatest terrorist attack, international terrorist attack, in French history. And so even though Judge Bruguier had compiled the case proving that the head of Libyan intelligence, a Mr. Sanusi, who by the way was Gaddafi's brother-in-law, and five other senior Libyan intelligence agents were directly responsible for an act of mass murder of 170 people, including many French citizens, and even though they had all been indicted by uh, the prosecutors in France, President Chirac decided to make a diplomatic deal with Gaddafi. He would not insist on any extradition of these six Libyans to France to stand trial for murder. Instead, they would have a trial in absentia, meaning a fake trial, like a a farce at the Paris Opera. No one would be held accountable. And in return, the Libyans paid a small amount of money to cover the cost of the investigation about 30 million euros. And of course, the French got into Libya through economy and oil contacts before the Americans and the Brits. And so that was the first diplomatic uh, shenanigan, if you want to call it that, where the interests of justice were really subsumed by the interests 
of the politicians and the diplomats. And that was, as you know, only the first of several steps where diplomacy became more important than justice. So let's move to the American part of this story. Uh, You describe being approached by Doug Matthews. Could you talk a little bit about Mr. Matthews and his role in helping assemble this case and reach out to the families of the seven victims? Doug Matthews was a uh, graduate of the Naval Academy in Annapolis, a decorated fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy. He served on the Kitty Hawk, flying F-4 Phantoms uh, during the Vietnam War. And after a very distinguished career as a Navy aviator, he became an international pilot for Delta Airlines, eventually rising to senior captain and flying jumbo jets from Atlanta, uh, where, of course, Delta has its main base, to uh, Paris and London. Eventually, he went into the aircraft leasing business and built the third largest aircraft leasing firm in the world, with almost 100 jets that his company owned, being leased to all the major airlines in the world. One day he got a call in September 1989 that one of the DC-10s he had leased to UTA, a French airline, which has since gone out of business and is now part of Air France, by the way, was missing. And there was a hunt for it. Eventually, of course, he found out from the French uh, about the crash and the bombing, and he closely followed the events in Paris long before I got involved. But He had heard about some of the work I had done for Terry Anderson and others, the uh, cases against Iran. And so he contacted me and said, could you represent me in a case against Libya, which I understand I can sue uh, under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act? I said, yes, you can. Um, And he said, I know there were seven Americans on the plane. Uh, I am in contact with them and um, I will uh, organize them to also participate in the case and have Kroll and Mooring represent them. And so when we filed the case, it was Interlease, the owner of the plane, uh, suing for property and and business damage, and the seven American families who had lost their loved ones on the plane. Only American citizens who were victims of terrorism could sue a foreign state. It wasn't until 2008 that that law was changed to allow uh, non-Americans who were employees of the U.S. government to file such suits. But back then, only the seven Americans and Interlease could sue. And so that's how the case began. And for several years, um, we were actually being assisted in the case by the administration of George W. Bush. President Bush, as you know, uh, was engaged in a uh, fairly intricate diplomatic game with Gaddafi and the Libyan government, which extended over several years, and was doing that while he was engaged with the war in Afghanistan after 9-11, and also after he had invaded Iraq in 2003. And so for several years, and and this is uh, part of the story told in the book, I worked closely with the State Department and other agencies. I had represented the State Department when I had been in the U.S. Attorney's Office, so I was not a stranger uh, to uh, the legal advisor in the State Department. And they even helped us get a liability finding of Libya's responsibility for the bombing, in addition to the French uh, evidence that I had collected. But then, Uh, As President Bush was nearing the end of his term in 2007 and then in 2008, it became clear that Mr. Gaddafi, Colonel Gaddafi and President Bush decided that a diplomatic settlement of all the Libya cases, including what was left of the Lockerbie case and the LaBelle Disco case and others, would be better resolved through a bilateral settlement agreement between the United States government and the Libyan government, a settlement agreement which was blessed by Congress through the Libya Claims Resolution Act. And as a result, the first and last judgment ever obtained against the Libyan government for terrorism, one that Judge Henry Kennedy of the U.S. District Court in D.C. had issued, was espoused, a constitutional term that says the president did away with it. He dissolved the judgment of the federal court, which was on appeal, and in return, signed a bilateral settlement agreement with the government of Libya where the Libyans paid $1.5 billion, with a B, billion, dollars for all the remaining cases against Libya, including our case. And my clients received a certain amount of money from that settlement, which, although not insignificant, was a fraction of what Judge Kennedy had awarded uh, 
in his judgment. So once again, just like with the French, the president of the United States and the U.S. Congress had decided that politics and diplomacy would trump justice. As you say in your book, just to rewind a little bit to the case itself that was in front of Judge Henry Kennedy, you were seeking a settlement or, or, or damages for your clients, but you were also seeking recognition in a court of law and the ability to have them testify and say openly, this is what happened to us. Could you go back and talk a little bit about that case and what it was like bringing together for the first time in one room, I believe just you know, a day before the testimony, you, you were bringing together these seven families for the first time in the same room. What was that like to be able to provide them a legal platform in which to talk about what had been done to them? Well, just recall for a moment that the Lockerbie families, remember that was 240 families who lost their loved ones over Lockerbie. They never had a trial. They never got a liability finding. They never testified in court against Libya. And there was a, a gaping hole in their efforts to obtain closure for that terrible act of terrorism. In contrast, when my clients all traveled here to Washington from diverse and disparate lifestyles, the seven people on the plane who had been killed, the Americans, did not know each other. And their families did not know each other. And other than through the connection of Doug Matthews and my law firm, they had never even spoken to each other or met. So when Judge Kennedy had the trial in federal court in Washington in the summer of 2007, they all came to Washington and came to my offices at Kroll and Mooring and for the very first time met each other and had a chance to see the families of the other American victims. And it was a very emotional and very touching gathering. And so the next day when we went to federal court, and I describe all this in the book, the emotion that was carried went into the courtroom and Judge Kennedy heard heart-wrenching testimony from family members, mothers who had lost their daughters, wives who had lost their husbands, children who had lost their parents, a husband who's lost his wife. They all testified about their loss so Judge Kennedy could assess the appropriate damages. And it was a very emotional and, and rather chilling experience. And I've handled a lot of these cases, embassy bombings, political assassinations, hostages. This was extraordinary. And one of the reasons it was so extraordinary was that Libya's lawyer was sitting there in the courtroom listening to all this. It wasn't a, an empty chair kind of case, as happens with Iran. But afterwards, even before Judge Kennedy issued the damages judgment, it was clear that the process of traveling to Washington from faraway places, of meeting the other affected American families, of presenting their testimony to Judge Kennedy, and doing it with Libya's legal counsel sitting there in the courtroom, provided a large measure of what I call emotional or psychological closure, which helped dramatically the healing process, I think much more than any financial compensation could ever provide. And that's been one of the most gratifying things about how this law and procedure works for victims and their families. So having been a part of this case and of other cases and seeing the twin paths of the needs of diplomacy, the foreign policy needs between, you know, two countries or even more countries and the needs of victims' families and victims themselves for justice. How do you reconcile that in your mind? How do you think about it when you're doing this work? Does this cause you sleepless nights that, you know, you were, you were able to provide this piece of justice for your clients, but no further because the larger needs of nations took them over? How do you think about that? as you go about your life and your work doing these international cases? Is it frustrating? Is it inspiring? It has to be interesting work. It's all of those things. <laughs> it is challenging. It is frustrating. It is exciting. It is rewarding. It is um, 
exhausting. It is expensive. Some of these cases go on for many years. The UTA case from the time I was hired till the time it was pretty much done was over 10 years. And um, it's part of what you sign up for. I'm fortunate to be a senior partner at one of the biggest and more respected and successful law firms in Washington. You need those kind of resources when you're going to take on oil-rich terrorist states. And it's serious business. You also need to be more than just a good trial lawyer. You need to be a good appellate lawyer because foreign sovereigns can take all kinds of appeals. We were in the D.C. Circuit repeatedly in these cases, and I, and I describe some of that in the book. You also have to have a sense of how the real world works, not just in federal court, but in the executive branch, the White House, the National Security Council, the State Department, the CIA, the FBI, the Department of Justice, and also Congress, because all three branches of our government get involved in these cases. It's not simply, let's go to court and see if we can win. You also need to be a student of history. You need to have relations with people in foreign countries that are affected. And you need to have an appreciation of what I call comparative law. As you see from the book, it's not just about the federal law that we use in Washington. It's about French criminal and civil law. It's about British English criminal and civil law. It's about Libyan law. It's about international law at the United Nations. And if you don't have an appreciation for the comparative law elements, you cannot do what is your most important job, which is to represent your clients and act as an advocate for your clients in every way possible. And that's, at the end of the day, what every lawyer has to bear in mind. What is in the interest of your clients and how can I best serve those interests as their lawyer? That's the challenge you have. And uh, it can be very frustrating, sometimes maddening. But at the end of the day, that's what you have to do. And if there are any young law students or young lawyers who are in our listening audience who have just heard what you said and thought, that's what I want to do, that's what I want to get into, what would be your recommendation for them? What should they be seeking out? Should they be studying languages? Should there be certain courses that they attempt to take? Should there be certain positions that they should try and seek either in the government or in law firms? Well, first, I should read my book, of course. Obviously, The <laughs> Forgotten Flight appetite. by Stuart Newberger. <laughs> Correct. But, you know, more importantly, it's, it's hard to... My partners are always telling me, Stu, you're always making this stuff up. Because in a way, you have to. If it hasn't been done before, that doesn't mean it can't be done in the future. A lot of lawyers and judges, arbitrators, think we're so locked into precedent that if it hasn't been done before, it can't be done. And you must be able to think creatively. Now, in 1996, when Congress enacted the terrorism exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, 21 years ago, no one foresaw that that law would open up the doors to the federal courthouse the way it has against Iran, Libya, uh, Sudan. I'm involved in a case now against Sudan. We just won in the D.C. Circuit a few weeks ago for providing safe harbor to al-Qaeda when it blew up our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. This is a very complex area. International law, procedure, evidence, um, federal court procedure, constitutional law, the limits of power of the president and, and of the Congress, um, international law, and the intersection and sometimes the tensions between international law and domestic law, comparative law, comparing choice of law, which I've taught at Georgetown. Uh, you know, how do you resolve conflicts between domestic law? So, Right there, you have a lot of things that people need to, to, to get into and get their hands dirty to understand it. But you also have to be a real student of history. You have to study the countries that you're suing and look at the political and not just the legal background. You have to have a sense of what motivates those countries, what are their strengths and weaknesses, what other tools might you be able to use to influence a case both inside and outside the courtroom. You know, I've been lucky enough in my career to have worked both in the government and outside the government. I've been a law professor and I've been a few other things. And I think that bringing all of those to bear has helped me and my team here at Kroll & Mooring do a good job or do the best job we could, I should say, to try and get justice for all of our clients without exception. And if people are interested in hearing more or communicating with you after they've read your book, 
The Forgotten Flight. Do you have any way that people can reach out to you? Yeah, there's a couple of ways. First of all, there's a website, uh, www.theforgottenflight.com, which has a lot of information about my firm and my practice and has some links to Kroll and Mooring's webpage uh, where you can email if you're so inclined or get other information about uh, the bios of me and the people who work on these teams and some of our other work. So that's probably a good place to start. Uh, the other is just to Google and, uh, you know, type in my name, type in the cases and see what comes up. You'll see quite a bit of interesting things. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. To our audience, thank you for sticking with us. And if you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast listening service.